Bien, bonjour à tous. Good morning to you all. Good afternoon, rather. So we're going to start this discussion. And we'll welcome here this impetus from the new generation to reuse the words from one of the students who's just asked a question. So you know that this new generation has a characteristic. They speak English. So I'll switch to English so that all of the members of the panel can understand what I'm about to say. So I'm very happy to talk about the, the next steps of the European construction um, with the next generation, which is not only with the decision makers we have seen this morning and at the beginning of the afternoon, but with the member of the, the new generation, uh, which will be in charge of designing uh, the future of the European Union. I'm all the more happy that I had written a book in 2005 called Europe, the time of the founding sons. And I must admit that, uh, unsurprisingly, Niklas Berggren is well ahead of me uh, on this regard, because he has gathered the founding grandsons, and not to forget the founding granddaughters, well represented in this, in this panel, which is quite logical to, 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 to debate about the future of the European construction. So these founding grandsons and uh, granddaughters have been working together for several months uh, in the framework of an initiative called Europe 2025, an initiative launched and supported by uh, the Niklas Berggren Institute and implemented by students from the RT School of Governance, Berlin, uh, the London School of Economics and Political Science, London, and last but not least, Sciences Po in Paris. Um, you will know much more about this project and initiative by, by consulting the blog uh, double slash eu 2025 word wordpress.com. So these six students besides me represent three working groups of around uh, 30 students coming from uh, uh, many EU and non-EU uh, countries, as we will see in a minute. Uh, they are here to present us the results of their reflection, uh, which have been structured around three main themes. The first one is the funding narrative, uh, the new funding narrative or raison d'être of the European Union. The second theme uh, covers a proposal to implement the direct election of the European Commission President. And the uh, third working theme um, consists of uh, combining civic and institutional innovations under the slogan Seven Pacts uh, for a better EU governance. So they will have a, a few minutes each to underline the most striking elements of their works. And I will then, of course, invite them to answer some questions from me and above all uh, from the audience. So I will start by the boys, uh, Ben and Bob. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so the group one is tasked, has been said, with producing a new narrative for the EU. And this seems an extremely daunting task to us. It seems to be based on a number of rather difficult assumptions, uh, which I'll go through quickly. So the first is that the EU needs a narrative. That, that seems it needs some defense. The second is that the old narrative, for whatever reason, did, doesn't work or doesn't resonate anymore. And the third is that it's actually possible to write a new narrative. And those are quite fundamental problems if you've been tasked with writing a new narrative. So, what I plan to do very quickly is to go through those three problems, explain to you how we try to overcome them, because I feel that that will then show why it is, how it is that we got to where we've got, which is what Bob will tell you about in a moment. So to begin with, why does the EU need a narrative? It seems a, a slightly odd concept. You very rarely talk about it in the context of any other organization or state. And it seems to imply something like a heading, some sort of idea of 
where we're heading and why, something which justifies the present for the sake of the future. And that's an idea which perhaps in Europe is under threat with the legacy of fascism, communism, perhaps an idea of any sort of destiny or heading is, is a problem when it's led to bad things in the past. But we don't maintain that. We think that actually it's very important for the EU to have a narrative. In part simply because output legitimacy or any sort of idea of legitimacy based on a contingent idea, economic prosperity perhaps, is inherently at risk and the crisis has shown that full well. You have an economic crisis and suddenly telling everyone that it's fine because you'll be more prosperous at the end of it seems like a rather problematic assertion. So what we're looking for and what we think that the EU needs is a narrative which makes things worthwhile, which legitimizes the EU. It's not just about this crisis. Try if you can, I know it's terrible, I'm trying to get a job, to look out of this crisis and try and think, not only are we talking about this crisis, we're talking about something which will make it worthwhile to be an EU citizen in the next crisis. And the crisis after that, ad infinitum. So everything we're talking about out here is simply to make the EU more legitimate because it provides something concrete which can be held onto regardless of contingent circumstances. So that's fine, but didn't we already have that? Doesn't the EU already have a narrative which is based on peace and prosperity and why, why, why are we just dismissing this out of hand? And we're not. We thought about this very hard. And what we did, in fact, was we uh, decided to get into the minds of young Europeans. We ran a series of online surveys. Hopefully, some people here filled them in. Um, about 1,200 respondents, 38 different nationalities. That's far more than there are EU member states. Some of that was deliberate, but also there was a stray Nicaraguan uh, who got in. I can't really explain that. Um, Ten different languages. And we also conducted a series of face-to-face -face interviews with a really interesting range of people. We had uh, people who were unemployed, we had ex-soldiers, we had city bankers, uh, monks, a range of interesting people who we sort of decided to just go out and talk to about this. And what we were looking for was we didn't just ask, what do you think of the EU, what do you think the EU should be? We tried to get beneath that to ask people about their hopes, their aspirations, also things they feared, their anxieties, in order to try and find something that would resonate and work out why, if at all, the old narrative doesn't resonate and what values we might pull out to create a narrative that does. And what we found interestingly was that actually it's perhaps an early pathology to say that peace doesn't resonate with young Europeans. It does. It came out very highly in all our research that actually peace is something which is important to Europeans. But there's a change because while we're valuing peace, it seems like they don't fear war. It's something you, you like peace, but when you say, oh, what are you afraid of? No one says war anymore of young Europeans. It's just not something which resonates anymore. So that would damage the idea that the EU has to be based on a narrative of peace. If people don't fear war, what's the point of making the whole narrative about peace? And again, when, with prosperity, I've already mentioned the fact that we're in a crisis now rather undermines it. And there seems to be a level of disconnect between what citizens want and what they get from the EU. They don't think the EU can help them out with prosperity. They don't think the EU is even an actor when it comes to employability, according to our surveys. What they do want are a series of other values, but, they don't, but those same values which came out most were the ones which were some of the least high results for when we said, what does the EU currently provide you with? And that's where I think I'll pass on to Bob, because what we found, the, key, the two really key things which you want to base this new narrative on are the ideas of solidarity and freedom. Thank you. So to overcome this narrative problem, we propose the following. Europe, land of freedom and land of solidarity. The biggest constraint, however, of a narrative based on solidarity is clearly the lack of compassion among us European citizens. For example, why should uh, Italians have cared about the Irish people losing their houses during the real estate bubble burst in 2008? Or why, in turn, should the Irish people care about the huge public debt in Italy? The key problem is that there are not sufficient social uh, ties within uh, Europe and between the European citizens. So far, European achievements such as the single market or the common currency have all been great achievements, yet they all lack one quite uh, vital ingredient, namely human interactions. Eating Italian food, drinking French wine or driving German cars or lying on the beaches of Spain and Portugal isn't enough to spark solidarity. This is why we argue that instead of focusing on free movement of capital, the EU should focus more and more on free movement of people, which might have the ability to foster cross-border friendship and more solidarity among European citizens. 
but how to create more solidarity and where should we begin? I know we've talked about quite a lot uh, this morning um, and we've seen that labor mobility is low for good reason. Different cultures, different languages within the EU pose severe obstacles for labor mobility and the European integration. So making students learn different languages might be um, a key to overcome this barrier. If you speak different languages from a small age on, you might be curious to discover different cultures, different languages within the EU, which could foster cross-border friendships and more solidarity among us. This is why we argue that the current Erasmus program should be made compulsory for all students in Europe. In addition to that, we extrapolate the same reasoning and argue that, should, that there should be some sort of job Erasmus for professionals, that they should, at the beginning of their career, work one year abroad. Um, for example, school teachers, they could easily work at the beginning of their career um, in a different member state and get to know the different cultures and languages. This increased mobility would, in addition, be beneficial for a new generation of entrepreneurs which, uh, could, which the EU could support furthermore by a seed capital fund. While some of you might say this narrative of solidarity won't resonate with certain countries um, because they will be made worse off, you will probably think about Germany. However, we beg to differ. For example, how will Germany sustain its future wealth with an aging population? Or how will, for example, Spain uh, come out of its employment crisis? Or how will Poland or any other European state voice its opinion on global negotiation regarding climate change? There is no national answer to all of these questions. These issues exceed the power of each individual state. But as a united Europe, we can turn today's threat into tomorrow's opportunities. Solidarity between us can help us retain our freedom and to live the life we want and to realize our dreams. This is why we argue that the Europe of tomorrow should embody a land of freedom and a land of solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like only one question out of your very interesting policy paper, in which you also propose to have uh, more uh, historical f persons on the Euro notes. And uh, you propose some names. Uh, I read, for example, uh, uh, Picasso, uh, but also Astrid Lindgren. So uh, I said to myself, well, I don't know who Astrid Lindgren is. So apart from telling us who she is, and I didn't Google, I, I just came here without knowing who she is, but my serious question is, what would be the criteria you propose to achieve such objective, which also be emblematic of a uh, kind of European identity? Well, um, to begin with, perhaps the more, the more drip, Astrid Lindgren. I don't, uh, can we do a show of hands? Is, can we do some direct democracy? Who, who's heard of Astrid Lindgren? Can we have some hands? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite a well-known. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's Astrid Lindgren, for those who di didn't raise their hands, is a Swedish author, uh, lots of children's books, very popular. Apparently, according to uh, Wikipedia, the font of all knowledge, the 18th most translated author in history. Um, I don't know if that's true, but anyway. Okay. To, to deal with the more substantive question, I, I see an opportunity here for the, the British member of this project to be controversial. Um, so I think there are two aspects of the criteria that I think need talking about. There's a negative one and a positive one. A negative one is, is who's being excluded. And I think in some ways this conference is an example of why this idea is there. So we've sat here, we've heard these wonderful speakers, these great names who you know, every student here will have heard of. But let's be cynical for a moment. Shouldn't it be a problem that there is a perception that Europe is run by a tiny mobile elite of white West European men? Because that's, that's who all the speakers have been, right, almost without exception. And isn't that a problem? And <laughs> if we're really talking about solidarity, the figures we've chosen, if we're really talking about solidarity, we want to get over that hurdle of perception that why should a Bulgarian look at the EU and say, that's our union and we're on an entirely equal footing with the French and with the Germans because personally, I don't see it. I mean, maybe this is a UK bias coming through, but I don't see why you should, because as far as I can see, the entire discourse seems to be that. What, what, did, Philippe, what did he call it? The wise men, the people who run Europe, this small group of, 
of white, middle-class, Western European men. So the people we chose tried to get over that hurdle. We specifically went after people who weren't from that criteria. So we went after Aristotle. We went after Marie Curie and uh, Astrid Lindgren and these figures who were just trying to get past that hurdle. I and mean, then the other reason that they've been chosen is less controversial. It's simply that we wanted to find an area in which was apolitical and yet there was pride which could be had across Europe. And we thought that science and art and these areas are the areas where, these are not political areas, but they're areas where we can say Europe has done something fantastic and creative and innovative in those areas. And so those are the areas we should be prioritizing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's now turn to the second group. So from the, we had boys from the UK and Luxembourg, and now we move to ladies from Canada and China, we mean out of the EU. So we're here to listen to your proposal to implement a direct election uh, of the European Commission president. It has, always, it has already been dealt with in the previous panels, but we, we are very happy to understand and to hear your suggestions on this. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I would just quickly like to say thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak to everybody today and to share the ideas that we've spent so many months working on. Um, our group was tasked with proposing a substantive reform to redesign the EU within a decade. Our group debated over many proposals ranging from um, expanding the EU's competencies to strengthening Lisbon's reforms to the European Parliament to writing a new treaty. But none of these reforms seemed to directly tackle the issues with which our group was confronted. After much deliberation, we settled on an institutional reform that we feel can give Europe a unifying leader. We propose the direct election of the Commission President through compulsory voting of the EU citizens and a strengthening of the president's power to execute a unifying mandate. We recognize that discussion of reforming the commission is not new. However, the key point is that few of these reforms have ever been tried. More importantly, this is a reform that has great potential to tackle what we define as the critical issue facing the EU, namely a lack of responsiveness. Citizens feel there is a mismatch between what the EU is doing and what they want it to do. They are unsure of what the EU is pursuing and are unclear about who is responsible for what. EU citizens want their government to tackle the issues that they feel are important, and they want results to be delivered. It is with this goal in mind that we devised the following fourfold proposal. The first part of our proposal outlines a procedure whereby candidates will be nominated through a two-stage process, first in their own national parliaments, and then through two rounds of primaries in the European Parliament. Following this, the field will be narrowed to two candidates who will then move on to election by direct suffrage of EU citizens. After a brief transition period, the elections will be run on the basis of one citizen, one vote. This procedure has been designed to ensure that the person elected is not only the best candidate, but one who has demonstrated their ability to respond to the issues that the EU citizens want tackled. Part two of our proposal outlines compulsory voting. If EU citizens want their government to be more responsive, they too must respond to their democratic duty and voice their opinion when asked who should lead the European Union. The issue of low voter turnout plagues the EU, a problem that must be resolved if the direct election of the Commission President is to have the desired impact. Compulsory voting holds great potential as a mechanism to tackle this, this issue and has produced concrete results in countries that employ it, like Luxembourg and Australia. This particular part of the proposal may seem prov provocative, but studies have demonstrated that compulsory voting can increase turnout between 7 and 16% and that it is a powerful tool that holds great potential to connect citizens to politics and to raise awareness of important political issues. I'll now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Hui Ma, who will outline the final two parts of our proposal and discuss its feasibility. So far, the nominations are taken at the level of national parliaments, and in the two primaries at the European Parliament, resources are mobilized and coordinated across national borders. Then citizens' voice is heard through direct suffrage, 
In the next step, we propose the president-elect to be subject to ratification by the European Council. And the threshold is unanimous dissent, which is defined as 26 out of 27 member states saying no, leaving out the country from which the president-elect comes. If the president-elect is not ratified, then the whole process will go back to the pri uh, first primary at the European Parliament. That's the third part of our proposal. And uh, for, uh, we have also recognized that uh, the whole process of uh, direct uh, election of the president of the commission will not tackle the issue unless the president has a supportive environment and a properly strengthened mandate. As such, we propose that the president of the commission would have a free hand to choose five commissioners, including the high representative of the commission for foreign affairs and security policy. One notable benefit is that the president will have a supporting team behind him or her and a bigger role to play in foreign and security policies. Another benefit is that the presidential candidates can use this as an election issue, as something to show his or her priority issue areas when running for the elections. The remaining of the commissioners would be nominated by national governments on a one member state, one commissioner basis. And in the fourth part, we have already uh, done a preliminary feasibility analysis with regard to financial resources, political will, uh, public opinions, and uh, uh, legal constraints. Our analysis has revealed that our proposal is feasible within the time frame of 10 years. For example, in terms of a political will, key actors have little to lose or something to gain. The European Council still have the influence over these over the whole process as guardian, uh, because it can guardian the whole process by ratifying the result. National governments can still have influence over the selection of commissioners. And national parliaments can come up with initial lists of candidates. And the European Parliament can trim down the list through the two primaries. In conclusion, we believe that our proposal has the potential to tackle the issue of lack of responsiveness by making the Commission President more able to act upon the wills of the citizens he or she represents. That's our presentation. Thank you for, for this very innovative proposal. You have been asked to think out of the box, and I suggest. I that's what you did. So I, I, you will probably have questions from the audience. I will only ask you one. Um, why didn't you propose an, uh, an open uh, primary system, I mean, a, a US-style system, to designate the party candidates able to run for the presidency of the European Commission? Uh, well, we decided on more of a, a more closed uh, initial primary to decide on the delegates that would go forward to primaries in the European Parliament. Uh, one, to provide an incentive um, to member states. It, it's near impossible to enact change within the European Union if that change disenfranchises the states that comprise that union. Further, it acts as a safety mechanism, reducing the number of sort of fringe political elements that can be led into the system. And I want to add something. Um, I think if uh, we have a, an open primary in the first place, and according to our proposal, citizens will be asked once again to vote on the two final candidates. So it's like they were told that they are going to vote for the president of the commission once in the primary, and then vote again in the final round. So it's like they will have a uh, election fatigue. If we give up the second part of our presentation, that is to only have the open primary by parties, uh, then according to the Lisbon Treaty, my reading of the Lisbon Treaty is that the, after, the nation, after the party groups within the European Parliament come, with, come up with different candidates, nominations, it is the European Council who will propose a candidate to the European Parliament. So this, once again, will make the space of the EU election far away from the citizens. But if the citizens are asked to vote only two candidates, they, they say, okay, I will have a swan, I will have 
an influence on the final result. But if they only are allowed to vote in the first primary, they will say, okay, so will my, will my vote count? Finally, it is the European Council will come up with a candidate. So that's uh, uh, some of uh, uh, the, the reasons. And another one, I think, uh, maybe I'm not an expert in this, but I think maybe different parties across nations have different ways of uh, running primaries. So it's difficult to have them to have open primary to harmonize this. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. It was very clear. So now I will give the floor to the representative of the third working group um, who have a very good sense of marketing because they did not only propose a two pack or a six pack, but a seven pack. So we'd like to know what is within such a pack in terms of civic and institutional innovation for better EU governance. Okay. So I just like to remind that our question was, which political government innovation are realistically implementable within a three year span? So it's a very short time. And as we were asked this question about European political governance, our first thought was, what about the European citizens? Because the EU is perceived as too distant and insulated from its citizen, and the information gap is, seems to get bigger and bigger. What is decided at the EU level? Who decides it? And more importantly, what is the impact of the EU in my daily life as a citizen? All those questions are unanswered, and this creates a vicious circle. Information gap leads to lack of civic involvement and de facto democratic deficit. We think that to enhance participation, people first need to know. Knowledge is really important and measure the impact of EU in their lives. So once they know, they can act. Once we know, we can act. So we, the young generation, we created the seven pack, seven proposal to improve civic involvement in the EU that we will present today, only five of our best. We propose new tools to give citizens both the opportunity to know more, to understand more, and then to express their opinion. And the role of national parliaments as well is crucial to enable a real European political debate. Because the EU is one of the most transparent bodies in the world. Most regulations at EU and national levels are now published and easily accessible online. Accessible, yes, but not intelligible. Most of regulations are com incomprehensible to most citizens, as well as the interaction, the complex interaction between national and European uh, levels. So our first proposal is to create a Google-like search engine, which will be an exhaustive database of Europeans and national regulation. Our idea here is to translate the information into intelligible terms and to classify it in terms of how to. How do I go study abroad? How do I open my own restaurant if I live in, a, in another European country? How do I vote? How do I get married with someone from another citizenship? We want to answer all those questions that require an interaction with any public figure. This website would gather both international and European regulation and give the citizen the ability to comment, write information, and also a public forum. To complement this website, we propose a better use of open government data, that is, different data is published by institutions at any level. We want to gather those data and compile them in a useful and efficient way. Today, there is one main open data portal in the EU that was recently opened, and we want to emphasize its great potential in terms of transparency in two ways. The first way, the need of an, extend, an extensive public campaign to inform the public of the, exist, the ex existence of such a portal. And the second way is through a second open data challenge. The first one was held in 2011. And that is a competition to boost private proposal for hands-on user-friendly application and visualization. Those tools are meant to improve the citizens' knowledge and understanding of the EU. Because once they know, once we know, then we can act. Yeah, thank you, Thais. The second part of our policy report act is about facilitating and encouraging direct participation and political representation. And I'll focus on the three main tools. First, an interactive online platform will increase direct participation by creating synergies between people involved in the promotion of the EU in the 2014 elections. For example, think tanks, political parties, and pro-European associations targeting every EU citizen. An online platform allows citizens to become actors of change themselves giving them a forum to get engaged, similar to the 2008 Obama campaign platform. The EU platform could include a map of all actions and events taking place in the EU, a new poll on a European issue of interest each week, a mobile app with a news feed. 
Connected to this platform is our next proposal about fixing the structural flaws of the European Citizens Initiative and is built on the idea that the ECI holds a high potential of improving representation in the EU. However, it needs to become more visible and establish more direct contact between citizens and institutions. A user-friendly platform supporting the campaign's efforts and collection of signatures serves the purpose of streamlining, standardizing, and simplifying the ECI registration process. Political representation is increased by bringing Brussels to national capitals. Today's collaboration between the national parliament and the EU information exchange is quite poor. In our third proposal, we suggest setting up bi-weekly meetings where European policymakers would be answerable to national members of parliament. It would target those people who hold key positions in the policy fields discussed. A rotating agenda setting power with each house of each national parliament provides an opportunity to select a topic of interest. Participation could be further facilitated through video conferencing, online translations, and a live streaming to the public. We also believe that we also believe in developing more informal communication tools by tapping into the potential, into the high potential of social media. The meetings need to be made a top priority with a dedicated time slot in National Parliament's agenda. In addition to those three proposals, our handout will then go into more detail about establishing a citizen's reference panel and campaigns for the 2014 Commission presidential candidates completing the seven pack. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like you to keep in mind that increasing the legitimacy of the European Union is crucial. By addressing the information gap and lack of civic involvement, these proposals start the process of eroding the chains that constitute the vicious circle preventing citizens from being a part of a legitimate and truly, demo truly democratic polity. In particular, the online tools are one of the most efficient ways to create a one-stop shop to inform and engage the public. By empowering citizens with the proper tools that strengthen their voice at the EU level, it enables them to proactively break what has been re restraining them. Without measures focusing on the improvement of legitimacy within the EU, the circle will only go stronger, worsening the problems currently plaguing the EU. For the sake of the European Union and for the sake of its citizens, it's time to act now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for this uh, Franco-German duo to have proposed this seven pact. We, we know more about it, but I would just like to ask you to elaborate on the simplification of the European Citizens Initiative registration process you have mentioned. Because this is something on the table already, but apparently not working that well. In your paper, you think of reinventing this European Citizen Initiative. So could you please tell us more about this? Yeah, we thought that the current design um, lacks the possibility of e effective campaigning prom and promotion, and, um, and it's not, it doesn't give the citizens a possibility of connecting amongst each other. So. Um, as I said, we see a very high potential in what has already been there, and we were also trying to find short-term measures, implemental, uh, being, yeah, being able to implement within a three-year time frame. And um, so we would connect it to an overall platform um, where, where the, the campaign's efforts could be supported and signatures could be collected, while citizens could um, communicate with each other having something like a snowball effect on this platform. Do you want to add something more? Okay, okay. thank you for this precision. Uh, it's now time to open the debate uh, and discussion. Uh, let me remind you once again that this is possible through the blog eu2025.wordpress.com, which is precisely conceived to, uh, to organize such a, uh, an open discussion through, throughout the weeks and days, but in the 
10, 20 minutes we have left, of course, it will be very, very interesting to have comments and questions from you. I see at least three generations in the room, so I don't know who want to start, and the microphone in this direction, maybe. Good afternoon. My name is Yves-Louis Jacques, and I'm a first-year student in, in the Sciences Po MPA program, the Master of Public Affairs program. My question is for Ben and Bob. I really like the spirit of your presentation. I think it dovetails perfectly with, uh, I guess, with our generation's sense of community and shared value. But my question is, uh, do you think it's feasible considering the growing nationalist movements in many European countries? Regarding the populism that's uh, growing in almost all of the European member states, I think um, those citizens, they don't realize what they actually benefit from the EU. So most people just, well, also due to the media, they just see the downside of the EU, that they have to make some concessions. But um, people wouldn't realize if we would go back to border controls, um, well, would restrain c uh, capital movements. So we, the world of the politicians, in my opinion, um, is to make sure and to make people real and citizens realize how much they actually benefit from it. And this would, well, if we would render the um, Erasmus program compulsory, this would help substantially because they would realize how much diversity there is and how much they can actually benefit from this. I, I totally agree with, with Bob. Um, I'd also add, we, unlike the other two groups, have an enormous advantage, which is that no one put a time scale on our... <laughs> on our proposal. So I, I'm not going to pretend that UKIP is gonna go away in a year if we bring this in, right? It's not. It's going to be nationalism for probably a long time. But this is an idea which we're hoping is going to be put at the front and center of the EU so that all policies will be evaluated by this criteria. And the hope, the dream, if you like, is that that should solve itself eventually. Now, whether it does, you know, who, who knows? I mean, after all, peace once worked for everyone. Maybe in 20 years' time, there'll be another load of students sitting here saying we need a new narrative because this one doesn't work anymore. But I think this is, this is the one for moving forward at the moment. That will be for the grand grandsons, if it's mm. correct. <laughs> and not to forget the daughters, of course. Uh, another questions or... Question or comments? Yes, sir? This one. This side. Chris Coles again. I'll apologize for shouting earlier in the day. Um, um, nearly 50 years ago, um, in a, an immediate conversation after the announcement of the potential to form the European community, I was thrown up against a wall and threatened violence because I was talking about a, uh, a United States of Europe and the other individual had no real understanding of what was implied. So I want to congratulate these young people for having the uh, common sense and courage to put their minds to work to resolve these sort of problems. But I want to make another point. When you talk about freedom, the greatest freedom you can ever have is not political, it's economic. And you've really got to put your minds to work as to how you resolve the problem of bringing prosperity right across the European community. Because I see that as your great challenge. It's not political, it's economic. Thank you. I totally agree with you, but um, the thing we propose is the Europe land of freedom, land of solidarity. Um, the freedom comes in that if we continue this way and we all just focus on our national problems but don't look at the European-wide or even worldwide problems, um, we won't be able to um, live the life we currently live. That's why, for, exa for example, um, the current pension scheme in Germany with an aging population, they would hugely benefit for a cross-border um, pension scheme uh, European-wide. The same goes for um, the European, uh, the, the Spanish crisis, the unemployment crisis. So the, if we don't implement more solidarity, our freedom would be restrained. And in, in addition to that, this will have an impact on the economic freedom, in, in my opinion. 
So I'd, I'd agree. I, I'd also not necessarily go along with the fact that it's that the highest form of freedom is, is economic. But even if we were to assume uh, that that were the case, I don't think that that's um, incompatible in any way with what with what we're proposing here. If if anything, I'd have thought that the two could coalesce very nicely together if solidarity also has an economic element to it. Uh, some of the things that we're proposing are more specifically e economic, so like a, a seed fund for young entrepreneurs. This is an economic policy, but, it's, but we're tying it into an overarching discourse of solidarity. That's, by the way, one of the comments which have, has been made yesterday during the, the meeting of the Council on the Future of Europe, organized by Nicolas Bergrin. The, the need to add maybe land of freedom, land of solidarity, but also as well land of opportunity. Um, uh, is there any other uh, comment or question from the audience? Maybe for the, for the young ladies? Don't be shy. Yes, please. So I have a question for uh, Lindsay and uh, Hui. Um, it's regarding the uh, commission president. Um, the low visibility that the commission president uh, enjoys these days is not only due to the fact that he's not directly elected. I think he, um, it's also due to the fact that he lacks competences. So um, if the commission president was following your proposal directly elected, would this actually lead to a higher visibility in everyday political life in the European Union? Or would it basically be irrelevant between European elections? Uh, to, to address the issue of visibility, I think that if EU citizens are actively making a choice for the person that they want to represent their issues, it, and if it's not tied to um, elections uh, for the European Parliament, which in some cases can tend to be a protest vote against national governments, I think it does hold great potential to allow citizens to know exactly who that person is that they've elected and to see what they're doing and then to hold them accountable. Elections are, are good for sort of a positive and a negative reason to reward candidates that show promise and to punish candidates that don't deliver on the promises that they make in those campaigns. Um, and to address the issue of, of competencies, um, our group did debate quite seriously the idea of expanding the competencies of the European Commission or just of the, the European Union in general and expanding the powers of the Commission. But we think first those institutions need to regain the trust of the citizens that they're supposed to be representing. And within a 10-year time frame, that's, it's not necessarily the most practical to expand both at the same time. I think it also depends on how you define visibility. In terms of uh, visibility within the EU, the direct suffrage process per se can help bring the EU institutions, bring the uh, Commission president closer to the citizens because he or she will advocate fiercely uh, their platforms for the EU in the future. And the citizens feel that uh, their issues are actually can be reflected by casting a vote. And in terms of external visibility, for example, US, China, now we have the difficulty of recognizing who is the head of the EU. There is a famous joke uh, which follows that when President Obama wants to make a phone call of the head of the EU and he asks, who should I call? And I think our president has encountered the same, the same uh, problem. So if we have uh, a, a democratically elected president and this president will have strengthened power, this is one step further to the federal, uh, federal approach. And from the outsider's perspective, we, we will see that this is the head of the EU. And in the future, I think it's good for the external visibility. Maybe an additional question. In this context, what are your expectations about what could happen next year, meaning in the framework of the Lisbon Treaty on the basis of the, let's say, open competition uh, which will be organized by the European political parties. Do you think it can help already, or is it not enough? I think it's an important, um, an important step in the right direction, but it, it, the issue that it, it falls down against is the fact that if MEPs are the ones 
who are electing the Commission president, and those MEPs only represent less than 50 percent of EU citizens, how is then the election of the Commission president meant, meant to represent the voices of all of Europe when only less than half of the population elected the people that are supposed to be electing the Commission president? I think there are some improvements, like recently the Commission has adopted uh, a kind of uh, decision uh, recommending that uh, the European Parliament uh, make efforts to allow their uh, candidates make link to their national party affiliations. That's a way to bring citizens closer to the election. I think there are definitely improvements, uh, but the key uh, issue is lack of responsiveness in uh, our proposal, so our way is to have a person directly respond to what citizens want and reflect their wills. Thank you. Other comments or question in this direction? Yes, please. Hi. Um, my question would be for the third working group, and it concerns the media, well, the medium of television, would you think that there's a form of finding a Eurovision, like not a Eurovision thing, but <laughs> a Euro, <laughs> Europe-wide uh, television program channel that would kind of um, not only inform people, but would also provide culture and that sort of thing? Or do you just don't consider it feasible? because it seemed to work quite well for the French, German, Arte television channel. Um, we thought about this, we thought about what the, the lack of European culture in general, we don't have the same newspaper, the same um, TV shows except for Arte between uh, France and Germany. Um, However, when we talked about this issue, we uh, realized it was once you get like a community and once people like citizens start to feel more Euro European, that through maybe private initiative, those kind of things could be tackled. But of course, it's an option and your vision is a great show. <laughs> Please, yeah, no Eurovision any longer. <laughs> uh, there was another question from... Good afternoon. I've got a question regarding Annika and Tay's presentation. Um, so the aim of your presentation was to find some realistic measures that could be implemented within three years. Uh, and I just wanted to know if you had a chance to, to have more thought about what could be done on a longer term to, to address the issue that you are working on like within 10 years or... Yeah, well, um, we had many ideas, actually. Yeah. That was the whole point of our debate. We had many ideas, and everything was like, no, not in three years, no, not in three years. So back to group two. two and back without to treaty two. changes, there was a yeah. more tricky part. So we thought about many things. We thought about, what, what about like uh, a Senate for, um, for the European Union with a representative from national parliaments? We, we, we thought of, of many things, but it, since it was outside our framework, we didn't address them in this paper. We, we, put, we put some ideas in an annex, though, um, but we figured that, yeah, going more into detail about, um, yeah, about the broader picture, but still being implemental in this very short time framework is more important than addressing, um, I mean, also very, very important and crucial issues like youth unemployment. But um, we thought that we first need the basic structures um, ready to then, maybe in the next project, <laughs> mm. trigger, trigger those issues. Thank you. Another question from the back. Yes, please. Hello, Alex Bocho, Sciences Po student in the Master of Public Affairs. I think all of the proposals are great, so my question is how do we implement them? Is uh, Nicolas Berggrün helping us with that? Is the council helping us with that? What's, what's the next step? That's a tricky question, not only to Nicolas, <laughs> but to you. Please. Should I start? Um, we all addressed in our paper, like the longer version of the paper, that you're welcome to read the feasibility of an all of proposal, from uh, who should do it, which institution should be in charge of it, and we, we try to roughly 
uh, estimate how, how much would it cost and everything. Um, then the purpose of our proposal is like for you to hear it and uh, to go and say it out loud. And if you like it, please implement it. Oh, help us doing it. Oh, help us doing it. I think as far as our group is concerned, uh, because most of our proposals are not as fixed as the other, we were tasked with finding a narrative, so we've produced a narrative, and then what we've gone along with it are these other ideas which might increase solidarity, which might help with this narrative. But the important and the substantive part is the narrative itself, and in terms of implementing that, you don't need a new treaty. You don't need a new political body of any sort. You don't need to put it in a constitution. There's, there's nothing which is required except that there is the will of people and of politicians to say this is what the EU is for, this is what it provides, and this is the direction in which we're going. And that's all it would, <laughs> that's all it would require. Um, but as I, I don't think there's a, there's a problem of implementation in, in a way in which there might be with a more substantive policy in that regard. Yeah, just to, to build on what Ben said, I think that political will is probably one of the most important aspects of any analysis of the feasibility of all three of these proposals. Um, specific to our group, we did look very closely at sort of necessary changes to treaties um, or whether or not a new treaty would have been required to implement our proposal. And I think one of the, the advantages of our idea is, is that it doesn't require the creation of a new institution. It doesn't require um, the cr creation of a new treaty. Um, it can be implemented within the current treaty framework with very sort of the changes that are easily implementable rather than a complete overhaul.